Uh, it looks like we're live on YouTube now. So uh, thank you for joining us for today's sales enablement training. My name is William. I'm on the product marketing team here. And today we are addressing the question, what is serverless? Uh, so this is a bit of a uh, two-part series, so to speak, uh, coming after uh, last week's enablement on uh, microservices. So I'll drop a link to that uh, training in the description of this video, and you can go and check out about uh, microservices uh, because of, of course, uh, understanding serverless really kind of depends on you understanding uh, a bit about microservices first. So with that, uh, just like mo many of our trainings, I've created a page live on our website. If you go here and navigate to uh, topics, uh, and then here to serverless, I've prepared all of this content available on this web page. Uh, of course, we'll continue to update this page. Or if you have additions uh, or corrections, please do submit a merge request to this page, and we can uh, we can keep it going. Uh, so with that, I tried to come up here with a definition of serverless, and I will say this is pretty difficult for several reasons. Uh, so serverless is a is a relatively nascent concept. Um, and if, um, if things like DevOps and things like microservices don't really have a definition, everybody means something a little bit different by DevOps, everybody means something a little bit different by micro, when they say microservices, there's not a standard stock definition. Uh, for serverless, that's even more true. Uh, if you, you know, Google around the web, what is serverless? Uh, you'll see 10 web pages that all have 10 slightly different definitions. So in fairness, I've, I've tried to come up with one that is, you know, granted from, from a GIT, very GitLab-centric perspective, um, but I think is indicative of what's going on in the industry. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, serverless is an architectural design pattern. Uh, so like microservices, it's, it's a way you're going to design your software application. Uh, and what it does is it takes advantage of event-driven code execution. Uh, this means that uh, code is, is executed by a trigger. So the big difference between serverless and other ways of running software is that in a, in a non-serverless application, the application is running all the time. So whether or not anybody's using the application, there's a server and it's up and it's running and it's ready to take requests. In a serverless environment, the, the, or I should say in a serverless application, the environment doesn't exist until there's actually requests. So when an event comes in, let's say you were running, um, let's say a web page off of a, a server in a serverless architecture, somebody would go visit that web page. And then when that event came in, uh, a, a, a server or a VM would be spun up or a container would be spun up at that moment on demand to serve that web page, and then that code would be executed and served. Um, so whether that's you know just a web page or service or whatever it is, that's the kind of concept behind serverless. And so uh, this tends to be uh, powered by cloud, what I'm calling managed services, uh, and we'll talk more about that. And the advantages here are that it becomes massively scalable because when you don't, you're not worrying about the infrastructure. Usually, either the cloud provider. Uh, or Knative and Kubernetes are, are taking care of that scaling. Uh, as events come in, uh, it just scales up and up and up and up, and then scales down, and you as an engineer or developer don't need to worry about that. So, so this allows you to build massively scalable and also very cost-efficient applications. Um, and the idea here is, like microservices, they're small, but even smaller, small discrete functions where the developers don't need to think about the code. So to uh, dig into that a bit more, uh, Adrian Cockcroft uh, is a um, just a you know a luminary in this space. He was the uh, you know the VP of engineering at Netflix, who essentially built Netflix. So if you uh, see some of this uh, guy's earlier videos, he's got some terrific videos on microservices and how uh, he designed essentially the, the early architecture for Netflix. Um, so you can imagine at that scale and at that level of excellence. And now he's, uh, you know, he's VP of uh, cloud architecture at AWS. Um, so this is a phenomenal video. I've 
added it to the page. It's only three minutes long. I recommend watching the whole thing, uh, but rather than duplicating a lot of the uh, visuals here, I think uh, Adrian Cockcroft had some really good visuals. So I'm gonna show a couple of them here just to help show uh, what hopefully will make it make sense. So if you can imagine that a monolithic application, as we talked about last week, is uh, you know everything's all in one. And then as you move to microservices, you begin to split that up. And then with serverless, you then essentially decompose those microservices into functions. So in a very similar way, if you decompose a monolith into microservices, when you move to a serverless architecture, this is the, the evolution of the business logic, you decompose those microservices into even smaller discrete units. Uh, almost even what I, would, what I would potentially argue is the smallest possible atomic unit of execution. So when you're just writing software, the, the, a function is essentially what that is. It's, uh, if you're familiar with functions in math, it's almost the same way where you have an input and you get an output. Um, although in, in programming, you can have side effects. And so it's not necessarily always that pure depending on how you architect. But the point is that you have a, a very small discrete um, unit of execution where that function just does one thing. Uh, so it's even smaller than a microservice. The other component here that I'll show is the idea behind uh, managed services. So if you're building a microservices architecture or you're building a ser uh, serverless architecture, often you yourself are not gonna run a service for every single component. Uh, I'll give you an example, um, your database. You, um, if you're looking to scale, uh, you may not wanna run all of the infrastructure and be like your engineering team or your ops team uh, you know, probably doesn't want to be responsible for the uptime, et cetera. So you may take advantage of something like uh, Amazon DynamoDB, uh, or for example, for uh, object storage, you may have uh, Amazon S3 buckets where you just store files um, and that's just stored off on Amazon. And so you don't need to worry about that uptime. They already have a service for that. Often these are, are um, you know, things that are differ undifferentiated heavy lifting, things that are not necessarily critical to your business. Everybody needs a database, everybody needs storage. And so Amazon and all the cloud providers have these services. Um, and so often when you're using a serverless architecture, you take advantage of these services. And so you can kind of see here's a very simplified architectural model and these represent a microservice. So um, you might have a microservice that interacts with these uh, various components and then of course, when you go to uh, serverless, which there is a really nice, I'm, I'm kind of scrubbing through the video, but uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, this, was a, this was such a nice um, illustration that I, I thought, you know, I'm just gonna put up this video, I'm gonna recommend watching the whole thing and I'm gonna borrow some of the video, some of the images from this training because this is just such a good video. Uh, but you can see here now there's a there's a path through where it hits various functions instead of hitting those microservices. Those microservices have now been decomposed into even smaller functions uh, as they make their way and, and interact with these other managed services. The last component is you can see that in a serverless environment, some of these are inactive. This is really the big differentiator is that uh, because that environment is created on the fly when that request comes in, and then it executes the code. And it usually sticks around for a while, um, you know, somewhere from like, you know, maybe 30 seconds, maybe five minutes. Uh, but if there's no more requests coming in, that, that, that environment just shuts down and, and gets blown away. Um, so you're not paying for anything. So this is, the, this is the big advantage here, is that if there's no load on the system, you aren't paying for the system. So. Um, this has amazing, these kind of amazing properties where even in a microservices architecture, even as it allows you to scale, the problem is, is um, if those microservices are, are just running all the time, you have to try to predict what the load will be um, and you have to try to scale your infrastructure for that load. With serverless, you just get that for free, essentially. You just get that... Um, I say for free, but you get that out of the box. The, this concept of scaling up and down 
is a, a core and integral component of what serverless is. Uh, and so you can see here that there are you know functions here that aren't even active. Um, they're just uh, there's no there's nothing running. And if it never gets any load, then you don't you don't pay for that essentially. Um, so hopefully that gives a, a uh, you know a construct of what serverless is and even some of the reasons how it can be valuable. Um, so now I'll just dig into um, just a few other kind of terms you'll hear in this space. So oftentimes you'll hear the terms uh, serverless, I've talked about managed services, and then FAS, uh, which stands for functions as a service. So functions as a service are um, things like Amazon Lambda or things uh, like Google Cloud Functions. That's what's actually going to run these little discrete units of code. And so a FAS is a specific type of managed service. So if you have over here, you know, your S3 bucket is your storage and Kinesis is your event stream and then Lambda is your FAS. Uh, so a FAS is a type of managed service. So the confusion out there is that sometimes when people say serverless, they'll equate serverless with FAS uh, as though they're the same thing. They're really not. Uh, serverless is the overall architectural pattern um, of, of building applications in this way and uh, using all of the things. So for example, you may use a service uh, like Firebase, which was acquired by Google. Uh, and Firebase is very, very popular in the serverless space. And it, it just has these same principles. It's event driven, an event comes in um, and it, and it uh, provides to you uh, content on the fly. So um, that's serverless, fast, managed services. Um, these are the attributes. So as I mentioned, small discrete units of code, event-based execution. Uh, I've talked a little bit about scale to infinity. Uh, since you as a developer aren't managing the, the cloud provider or, or Knative and Kubernetes are managing the scaling up of your application as it gets more requests, it just scales up for you. Uh, but the really key important component is also this scale to zero. This is the idea of if there's no requests, the environment shuts down and you're not paying for that. Now, obviously, if you are running serverless on something like Kubernetes, it always needs to have some amount of nodes in a cluster in general. But uh, if you think of this in an enterprise environment where uh, you could have many different business units that are um, you as a IT org are, are billing those business units on their usage, then that business unit would effectively scale to zero. So that's how I'm going to treat that one there. Uh, and then use of managed services. So I've added a little chart to the page. Um, the one I'm not super comfortable with is I've, I've called Knative here a fast. It, it isn't really uh, Knative is uh, open source software is sponsored by Google, but IBM Red Hat, others contributed. We leverage it inside of GitLab serverless. And so Knative uh, provides primitives that would allow you to build your own FAS. Uh, and so it's not quite a FAST in and of itself, whereas Lambda, Cloud Functions, Azure Functions are. But uh, I just put it there because that's what we used in GitLab serverless, which really I probably could put GitLab serverless as the open source FAST. That would be a bit more accurate. Um, but there's some, some open source, you know, for example, if you think of Redis, uh, that chart there, you can examine. So the business value of serverless, very similar to microservices, but even more so, right? So, so in, uh, in microservices, um, you know, the developers probably at some point are still having to think about where their code is deployed. Uh, it's no longer a monolithic app. They don't, no longer need to worry about all of the other people, but they do still need to worry about where their code is deployed and what it's running on. In a serverless architecture, the engineers or development team doesn't even need to worry about that. They just focus on the business logic and the uh, environment is taken care of for them. So this is a massive developer productivity uh, pace of innovation gain by moving to a serverless architecture. So even though this is very nascent technology, relatively bleeding edge, cutting edge things, um, this is the value that uh, everyone from startups to enterprises are getting out of this. So some of these same ones, stability, scale, uh, and of course, lower costs, even more so. So in a microservices architecture, your costs are lower because you're only provisioning per microservice. In serverless, 
your costs go down to the absolute minimum because if the service isn't running, if there's no load on the service, you're not paying for it. And so these ones right here, faster pace of innovation and lower costs are the key drivers of businesses and organizations moving to serverless or adopting serverless as their architectural pattern. Uh, with that, we do have GitLab serverless. So GitLab serverless is a your own fast built into GitLab. So we leverage technologies like Knative, those uh, primitives that, that, that open source uh, serverless primitives I talked about, uh, and uh, Kubernetes to essentially allow you to have your own fast built into GitLab. So the idea here is you can write your functions and you don't need to necessarily write a Lambda function or a Google Cloud function or a, uh, an Azure function. They, they all behave a little bit differently and they all require a few little bit of a different things. Uh, and if you wanna move your functions from Lambda to Azure functions, then now you have a cost of that migration. Uh, so running multi-cloud functions is not necessarily a, a simple or solved thing, although there are all things like serverless framework I won't talk too much about today, but the idea here, the advantage of having this all in GitLab is A, you basically just get to write your idiomatic functions and you can write them once and your compute can be on any cloud or it can even be on-prem because you're, you're relying on Kubernetes for the scaling. And uh, so it doesn't matter what your cloud backend is, uh, you can still run your functions and you can run those workloads where, on any cloud or in any, even with an on-prem if you, if you want. Uh, the other advantage here is um, that I put on the page, I just want to call some ones out. It's part of the same single application. So in the same way that GitLab has this value and this benefit of your, you've got your code and you've got your CICD and they're in one place and it's one tool, that's the same value of GitLab serverless is that now your serverless workloads, now your, your, what you're using to, to build serverless is all part of the same end-to-end -end DevOps application. Um, and then of course, if you're trying to use Knative directly, there's some complexities involved in that. So we've really simplified that. The only caveat I'll, I'll put to this is that serverless, if serverless as uh, an industry term is very new, GitLab serverless is even newer. We just released the first iteration of this last month. So you will see this rapidly evolving, becoming more robust. GitLab serverless is extremely new today. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's new and there's rough edges, but it will be evolving very, very quickly. So uh, with that, I will link this page. Like I said, I recommend checking it out and adding MR. And